Um, okay, so I'm just going to read a couple of pages from the friend, and in this uh, in this part, the the narrator is is walking her great dame Apollo. Did you read about the Tibetan mastiffs? I had indeed read the article in the Times, and I say so, but the woman's need to vent is too great. She tells the story anyway. Only a few years ago in China, the Tibetan Mastiff was a status symbol, a luxury item priced at the equivalent of an average of $200,000, with some puppies said to sell for more than a million. As the mania peaked, more and more dogs were produced by grasping breeders. Then the mania died. Worth too little, eating too much, the huge and sometimes hard to control dogs were no longer wanted. What came next? Mass abandonment, dogs packed into transport trucks where they suffered horribly and many died, the slaughterhouse. Truly not a story I needed to hear twice. The woman is someone we often meet when she's out walking her own two dogs, gentle mutts, mother and daughter. From the news story, she goes into her screed, it too something she's shared with me before, about the evils of dog breeding. Mutts are what nature intended, mutts are what should exist. But what have we got instead? Idiot collies, neurotic shepherds, murderous rottweilers, deaf Dalmatians, and labs so calm you could shoot a gun at them and they wouldn't suspect danger. Fur vegetables, cripples, morons, sociopaths, dogs with bones too thin or flesh too fat. That's what you get when you breed dogs for the traits people want them to have. It should be a crime. I thought this woman was crazy when she told me about pointers that freeze in point posture and then can't get out. <laughs> but this grotesquerie turns out to be fact. I shudder to think what it will be like 50 or 100 years from now, says the woman, looking very dark indeed. But by then she adds, the whole earth will have been destroyed. And perhaps consoled by this thought, she takes her mutts and moves on. I am left thinking about the Mastiffs. Besides their great bulk and a mane that makes them look part lion, they are known for being fiercely protective and loyal to their masters. So what does a dog bred for those traits feel when its master lets it be herded onto one of those transport trucks? Does a dog understand betrayal? I think probably not. I think the main thing on the Mastiff's mind all the way to the slaughterhouse is, who will protect Master now? A digression. <coughs> About animal suffering, what do we really know? There is evidence that dogs and other animals have a higher tolerance for pain than humans do, but their true capacity for suffering, like the true measure of their intelligence, must remain a mystery. The writer J.R. Ackerley believed that being so emotionally involved with people and trying forever to please them made a dog's life chronically anxious and stressed. But did they get headaches, he wondered. <laughs> Not even that much about them being known. Another question, why do people often find animal suffering harder to accept than the suffering of other human beings? Take Robert Graves writing about the Battle of the Somme. The number of dead horses and mules shocked me. Human corpses were all very well, but it seemed wrong for animals to be dragged into the war like this. Why of all the terrible memories of his ordeal as a POW in Japan during World War II, was Olympic athlete and US Army airman Louis Zamperini most haunted by the memory of a guard torturing a duck. Of course, in each of these cases, the suffering was caused by human behavior, in the case of the duck, an act of pure sadism. But aren't animals always at our mercy? And doesn't the pity we feel for them have to do with our understanding that the animal itself has no way of knowing the reason for its pain? a fact that makes some people insist that animals must suffer even worse than humans do. 
I believe the intensity of the pity you feel for an animal has to do with how it evokes pity for yourself. I believe we must all retain throughout our whole lives a powerful memory of those early moments of life, a time when we were as much animal as human. The overwhelming feelings of helplessness and vulnerability and mute fear and the yearning for the protection that our instinct tells us is there if we could just cry loudly enough. <laughs> Innocence is something we humans pass through and leave behind, unable to return. But animals live and die in that state. And seeing innocence violated in the form of cruelty to a mere duck can seem like the most barbaric act in the world. I know people who are outraged by this sentiment, calling it cynical, misanthropic, and perverse. But I believe the day when we are no longer capable of feeling it will be a terrible day for every living being, and that our downward slide into violence and barbarity will be only that much quicker. Thank you. I'm going to read a, a translation of uh, a poem of Montale, who is my one of my great heroes. and. Uh, he has written poems about the landscape near Cimicella, but I'm going to read one about Florence, uh, which is not that far. And um, it's called Times at Bellos Guardo. Bellos Guardo is a hill to the south uh, across the Arno, uh, uh, where a, a lot of beautiful villas are, and uh, uh, it's it's one of the most unreconstructed uh, parts of, of 19th century Florence, and it's, it's an amazing place. <clears throat> Times at Bellos Guardo. Oh, how there in the glittering stretch that arcs toward the hills, the hum of evening lessons, and the trees chat with the hackneyed murmur of the sand, and how this common life no longer owned by our breath, gets channeled there, crystalline, into orders of columns and willows at the edges, and great moats in the gardens by the overbrimming pools, and how a sapphire light returns for the men who live down there. It is too sad such peace should enlighten in glimmers, and everything then roll on with intermittent flashes over the steaming river bends, with intersecting chimneys and shouts from the hanging gardens, and consternation and long laughter over patched roofs among the arises of massed branches, and a brilliant tail that trails across the sky before desire can find the words. Forlorn on the hill, brown green magnolia boughs, when the wind arouses a troubled agitation of chords from the frigid area of the ground floors, and every leaf that sways or flares back in the thicket drinks that greeting in in every fiber. And more forlorn the limbs of the living that get lost in the prism of the minute, the fevered limbs devoted to the movement that goes on and on in its small round, sweat that throbs, sweat of death, minute mirrored acts that never change, refracting echoes of the beating up above that facets sun and rain, swift swaying between life that goes and life that stays. To escape up here, we die knowing or else choose chameleon heedless life another death. And the path descends among lodges and herms. The cord stirs the stones that have seen the great images, honor, unbending love, the gain, unchanging faithfulness. Yet the gesture remains. It measures the emptiness, sounds its limits, the unknown gesture that describes itself and nothing else, unending passion, 
collection of blood and brain that won't return, and maybe it enters the clothes and breaks the lock with its fine pick. The clatter of the roof tiles shattered by the storm in the expanded, in the expanded air that doesn't crack. The bending of the three-point Canada poplar that shivers in the garden at every gust and the sign of a life that accords with the marble at every step, the way the ivy shrinks from the solitary thrust of bridges I can make out from this height, of an hourglass measuring not sand, but works and human faces, human plants, of water calm under follies, no longer raging to explore the pumice grottoes. Is it gone? A long sound comes from the tiles. The stakes barely hold up the morning glory's coils, and the locusts that rain from the arbors onto the books limp off. Hard labor, Heavenly 